Welcome to another Swordmaster Publications presentation. My name is Ernie Lawrence. Today we're going to be studying Joshua chapter 15. Now I want to get a couple of things straight here. As we go through Joshua chapter 15, there's a, a few things to keep in mind. Number one, Joshua is writing this towards the end of his life. Um, he is not necessarily writing everything in chronological order, but more in a thematic order. We saw this with a chapter where they had already gone through and conquered everything, and everything was said to to be at peace. Um, but then we have a, uh, a separate chapter where Caleb comes in and says, I want this piece of land. And so this is going back and recording the specifics of those details where Caleb went in and conquers down in the land of Judah and all that area. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through this. Also keep in mind, God has declared that his promise is fulfilled, but we also have to keep in mind that mankind has free will and that God, even though he has given them the promised land and has done all that he said he would, that the Jews were notorious for not doing the things that God said to do. Um, they failed to consult him with the town of Gibeon, um, and there are other indications here that they don't completely follow what God said. That does not make God a liar. That makes man fallible. And, and that's important to understand as we go through here and we read some of the things that Joshua um, writes about. There are no contradictions in the Bible, but God declaring a thing done doesn't necessarily mean that man followed through. And we can see this very evidently on the cross when Jesus was given for the sins of the whole world. John 3.16 says that, that God so loved the, the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Jesus was given as, as a, a, a way to heal all of mankind, but not all of mankind follows through with what he's supposed to do according to God's gospel call. And so keep those things in mind as we read through Joshua chapter 15 and, and realize that there are no actual contradictions in the Bible. <clears throat> Start in verse 1. This then was the lot of the tribe of the children of Judah by their families. Even to the border of Edom, the wilderness of Zin, southward was the uttermost part of the south coast. So we're talking here about the tribe of Judah specifically and all the things that pertain to that uh, land promise that they ended up actually going out and conquering. And their south border was from the shore of the Salt Sea, that's what we call the Dead Sea, from the bay that looks southward. And it went to the south side of uh, Melahakrabim and passed along to Zen and ascended up the south side unto Kadesh Barnea. That's where they were when they were doing the whole spy thing and um, sent out in Numbers 13. And passed along to Hezron and went up to Adar and fetched a compass to Karka. From thence it passed toward Asmon and went out unto the river of Egypt and the goings out of the coast were at the sea. This shall be your south coast. The east border was the Salt Sea, even unto the end of Jordan, um, and their border in the north quarter was from the Bay of the Sea at the uttermost part of Jordan. So I want to I cover what we've been talking about here. We've got a map. We're talking about Judah here. So we talk about the southern part of, of the Dead Sea, and there is a, a location here that uh, Joshua talks about, and then you have south of that were the Edomites. And they were to be left alone, eventually become a, a, a problem for Israel. We read about them quite a bit uh, in the later books of history and the books of prophecy. But then they go all the way down here to uh, Kadesh Barnea. Remember, there's the wilderness of Zen. Here's Kadesh Barnea, uh, where they uh, were camped and sending out the spies. And then all the way back up, and you have here this idea of the, the river of Egypt. Um, and I, I still am kind of out on this. What does the river of Egypt actually mean? I've not seen anything uh, too specific. Um, but from a historical perspective, the river of Egypt uh, is something that was uh, a, I, I guess, from Judah uh, out to the Mediterranean Sea that allow, allowed uh, access to Egypt. And perhaps that's why it's called the river of Egypt. But there was this river that was in the kind of the south area here, and it created a border between the Amalekites and the Philistines. 
And this region here, over Philistia and the Amalekites, this was all supposed to be Judah as well, but they don't take it. They, they choose not to take it um, for uh, whatever reasons. And so Philistine, the Philistines become a thorn in the side of Israel throughout the, the books of history. You read about them constantly, obviously. They're still around when David is, is a boy, um, and just you, you keep constantly reading about the Philistines because they never get taken out, even though God said, I've given you this land. And so um, we aren't given the reasons like we were at Gibeon. Um, same thing is going to be true of Jerusalem. Uh, even though the, the army of Jerusalem was taken out and the men of, of uh, the city were taken out, the Jebusites, actually the women and children, uh, it implies, are left there. Like, they do not actually kill them. There's a lot of people, well, God was just causing the Israelites to go around and kill all the women and children and everything. There's a lot of evidence that that's not actually the case. And, and we see it explicitly in Jerusalem where we know all the men uh, of fighting age were killed. But we're going to see where uh, a lot of the people that remained behind in Jerusalem were left alive and became kind of vassals of the Israelites in that city. So, <clears throat> anyway, uh, looking at those borders, of course, we, we talk about the, the Jericho ending in the Dead Sea. So they get this little portion here and then uh, going all the way across to uh, this. And, and they're supposed to have all the way to the Mediterranean, which you'll see here. Uh, in the western uh, side. It says, And the border went up to Beth Hogla and passed along by the north to uh, Beth Araba. And the border went up to the stone of Bohan, uh, the son of Reuben. So that's talking about here, uh, over on the, the east side here. Um, and the border went up toward Debir from the valley of Achor, and so northward, looking towards Gilgal, uh, that is before the going up to Adumim, which is on the south side of the river, and the border passed toward the waters of En Shemesh, and the goings out thereof were at Enrogel. So again, these are some very specific, um, uh, detailed directions about where all of the, the border was supposed to be, because this is a very populated area. It's a very important thing to very clearly define who gets what. So headed towards Gilgal, there's Gilgal there, and then you kind of turn over and you head in terms of um, going towards the Mediterranean and, and these other towns that they're talking about here, uh, like Enrogel. <clears throat> and then it says, And the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom. That is very, very important, the valley of the son of Hinnom. So, And the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom, under the south side of the Jebusite. The same is Jerusalem. And the border went up to the top of the mountain that lies before the valley of Hinnom westward, which is at the end of the valley of the giants northward. So as the border passes by, Judah and, and Benjamin essentially share Jerusalem. And that valley of Hinnom is what is later referred to as Gehenna in, uh, when Jesus is talking about um, the place of eternal damnation. He uses the valley of Hinnom as a metaphor because it was a valley where they threw all their trash and they would burn it and that fire never went out. And so he, he looks to this place just outside of the city, the holy city, Zion, whatever you want to call it. Um, and he says, he, he talks about, you know, the, the valley of Hinnom or Gehenna and how the fire is never quenched or whatever. And he relates this to the, the location or the state of uh, eternal damnation. When eternity comes and time is no more, you are either in the right relationship with God and therefore in his presence, or you are not. And that's where you are in eternity. And so here you have this becoming a very, and it, it's not just mentioned in passing here, but the Valley of Hinnom becomes something that you hear uh, quite a bit, just like the um, uh, idea of Mount Megiddo. You're going to hear a lot about that as well. These are these are well-known places in the Hebrew mind because they're talked about so much and they have such uh, prominent places in their history. <clears throat> and the border was drawn from the top of the hill unto the fountain of water uh, of Neftoah and went out to the cities 
of Mount Ephron, and the border was drawn to Bela, which is Kirjath Jerim. And the border compassed from Bela westward to Mount Seir, and passed along unto the side of Mount Jerim, which is Chesalon or Kesalon, probably um, is the better pronunciation, on the north side, and went down to Beth Shemesh and passed on to Timnah. And the border went out into the side of Ekron northward. And so again, we're, we're going this way, so out towards Ekron. And you can see the border is supposed to go out this, this direction. Um, <clears throat> and the border was drawn to Shikron and passed along Mount Bela and went out into Jabneel and the goings out of the border were at the sea. We're at the sea. So where is the border? This is all Judah. This is claimed by Judah. And so this is this is the land that is given to Judah according to all of that is being said here. And the west border was the great sea, that's the Mediterranean, and the coast thereof. This is the coast of the children of Judah round about according to their families. So all of this that everything that was claimed, here's the river of Egypt, all of this that's claimed, Philistia is one of those places that was given to Judah and is considered part of their land. That they don't kick the giants out in some of those cities uh, becomes, that's their choice and their free will, even though God had said, hey, that's your land, and it comes back to bite them later. <clears throat> Verse 13, And unto Caleb the son of Jephunneh he gave a part among the children of Judah, according to the commandment of the Lord, or of Jehovah, to Joshua, even to the city of Arba, the father of Anak, which is the city of Hebron. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Sheshai, and Ahiman, and Talmai, and the children of Anak. So these are the Anakim, the, the giants. And he went up there to the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir before was Kirjath Sefer. Remember, Kirjath just means city, city of Sefer. Um, and so, once again, we've already completed this um, campaign. Now we're getting into some of the details, more of the details of uh, who did what and where and when. And so these are, these are specifics of Caleb and his part in the fight. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it and gave him Aksa, uh, Aksa his daughter, to wife. Um, and it came to pass that as she came unto him, that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What would you do? Um, so this word brother here, and I, I want to I be clear about this. This word brother is a loose term. And it can relate to somebody who is a relative, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have the same parents. And so when Othniel, who is the son of Kenez, obviously he's not uh, Caleb's brother because Caleb is the son of Jephunneh. And, and just to clear that up, because some people say, what, Caleb is, is marrying his uh, niece or whatever? No, that's not what's happening here. And so um, <clears throat> you have somebody, and, and they did. The, the Israelites did marry within their own tribes. They, they tried to keep their tribes straight because of the land promises. And so there is, there is a little bit of uh, a kind of a tightening of the genealogies because of this, but they could marry across tribes. Generally, the women would come from one tribe and become part of another. Um, but please understand, there is no contradiction here, and there is no violation of Leviticus 18, where it talks about the, the near marriages and stuff like that. He is not marrying his niece. Um, and so this, this young, young girl uh, is given to him, and she comes and asks a blessing, and he's like, what do you want? What, what, what can I give you? And she answered, give me a blessing, for you have given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. And so he, he, he gives her all these blessings. He obviously likes the girl, and he's saying, hey, whatever you want. Um, so Caleb's a pretty nice guy here, uh, trying to treat her right. And it says, this is the inheritance of the tribe of Judah according to their families. Um, and so now it's going to name all these cities that are involved in Judah. And the uttermost cities of the tribe of the children of Judah toward the east coast of Edom southward were Kabziel and Eder and Jager. And again, you can, you can see a lot of these named uh, in this area. And I'm just going to read them because they're just a bunch of city names. And Kina, and Demona, and Adada, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Ithnan, Ziph, and Telem, and Beeloth, and Hazor, Hadatha, I think that's a T that's pronounced, Hadatha, 
and Kerioth and Hezron, which is Hazor, Ammon and Shema and Maloda and Hazar Gada and Heshmon and Beth Pele and Hazar Shual and Beersheba and Biz Joth Jah, Bela and Lim and Azam, or maybe that's I am because the L would be capital, uh, and El Tolad and Kessel and Horma. And Ziklag, and Madmana, and Sansana, and Labaoth, and Shilam, and Ain, and Rimon, all the cities were twenty and nine with their villages. And in the valley, Eshtaal, and Zoria, and Ashna, and Zenoa, and Inganim, Tapua, and Inam, Jarmuth, and Adulam, Soko, and Azekah, and Sharem, and Adathame, and Gedera, and Gedarothame, fourteen villages with their fourteen cities with their villages, and Zenon, Hedasha, and Migdalagad, and Delian, and Mespa, and Jokthiel, Lakish, and and of course Lakish is going to be one that you see a lot, uh, Bozkath, and Eglon, and Cabin, and Lamam, and Kithlish, and Gedaroth, Beth Dagon, and Nema, and Makeda. 16 cities with their villages, so you can see there's like a lot of cities here. Libna and Ether and Ashnan and Jipta and Ashna and Nezib and Kala, uh, Kala and Akzib and Marasha, nine cities with their villages. Ekron with her towns and villages. From Ekron even unto the sea, all that lay near Ashdod with their villages. So we're we're talking Ekron, Ashdod, so we're, again, into the Philistine lands. These were all given to them, and these things were said to be given to Judah at this time. So even though our map says this is Philistia, what we had is the, 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 tribes of, the tribe of Judah was given all this land. They conquered a lot of this land, but there were strongholds of the Philistines that remained. And so um, while they, they ended up taking the borders and, and they claimed the land, they had these individual cities that they had to deal with. So Ashdod with her towns and her villages, Gaza with her towns and her villages, unto the river of Egypt and the great sea and the border thereof. Okay, so Gaza, again, Gaza's right down here, uh, given to Judah. Um, and in the mountains, Shamir and Jatir and Soko and Dana and Kirjath Sana, which is Debir, and Anab, and Eshtemo, and Anim, and Goshen, uh, and uh, Holon, and I wonder if Goshen was named after, like, Egypt Goshen, like they were remembering being back in, in there, and they, they named it the same thing, because Goshen was a good thing, right, they were given the land of Goshen, which was the best land, so I wonder if they were remembering Joseph and all of that, and Goshen, and Holon, and, and Gilo, 11 cities with their villages, Arab, and Duma, and Eshin, and Janim, and Beth Tapua, and Afeka, and Humta, and Kirjath Arba, which is, and we already talked about Kirjath Arba, that was Caleb's, which is Hebron and Zior, nine cities with their villages. Zior is important, because we, we talked about Zior uh, back, back with Lot, I believe. It was the one town that he kind of fled to after he left uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, and God ended up not destroying it. Uh, because a lot had gone there, even though God destroyed uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Maon, Carmel, and Ziph, and Judda, and Jezreel, and Jokdim, and Zenoa, Cain, Gibeah, and Timnah, ten cities with their villages, Halhul, Bethzur, and Gedor, and Marath, and Bethanoth, and El Eltekon, six cities with their villages, Kirjath Baal, which is the city of the Lord, which is Kirjath Jerem, and Rabbah, two cities with their villages in the wilderness, Betharabah, Midden, and Sekaka. That's a fun name. <laughs> and Nibshan, and the city of Salt, and Engedi, six cities with their villages. And then, uh, uh, th this is the cities. These are all the cities that are in Judah. Okay? And then, listen. As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out. But the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. So they take the city of Jerusalem. We've already read about that. They wiped out the army. There were five armies that came together against them. 
and they took them out. Armies were gone. They wiped them out to a man. Then they go back in and they take these cities. So they've already taken the city. We've already seen how that. But then it says the children of Judah could not drive them out. Some people will read this and they'll say that that was military, that they couldn't drive them out militarily. That's not what it means. They're, they're in there with them. They live in the city with them. They couldn't drive them out in terms of, we're talking the only people that are left at this point in time are old people, women, children, uh, the people that could not fight at all because all of the fighters went out with the army. And what it means is that they could not, they could not bring themselves to completely drive them out or destroy them. But it's important, could not drive them out indicates that the common practice of the Israelites was not to go in and wipe out all the women and children, but to drive them out, go away, go to another land, and this land is now ours. So the driving out of the people was the common practice um, after the armies were destroyed. And a lot of people will come in, and, and this is a big problem for them, and they'll say, God was just this wrathful God that all he did was he murdered babies, he murdered pregnant women, and they'll bring in all these emotional arguments. The reality is God was only having them drive these people out. And remember, the adults are wicked people. These are, are wicked nations. The Jebusites was one of the, the uh, big five that were named as wicked nations. And God says, D drive them out. There shouldn't be anything left. Well, when they get there, they've killed all the men. The Israelites take the city, and they cannot bring themselves to drive these people out. And they remain among them, the women, the old people, and it becomes an issue for them. They leave this corruption, this wickedness among them. Now, is it possible that the Israelites also had a positive effect on these people? Sure. But God talks about it, and it's a negative one. Anyway, I know this was a lot of city names and, and whatever, but um, it's an important chapter because uh, we need to deal with these, these alleged contradictions. We also need to cover the land promise. So thank you for staying with me on this. My name is Ernie Lawrence. This has been another Swordmaster Publications presentation, and we'll see you next chapter.